Our next speaker um, is actually, I, I call him the inspiration for this conference um, because about 18 months ago, it was Marv Seppala who gave me my aha moment about addiction and realizing that there are many, many fa facets to substance abuse and, and recovery. Um, when I heard him speak, um, he inspired me to get involved. And so um, my hope in bringing him to central Wisconsin is to have other people here in the audience have their aha moments as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Marv Seppala, who is Chief Medical Officer of the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. Good morning. <laughs> Glad I made it, actually. I managed to, I, yeah, I, got, I came, I flew in from Portland, Oregon yesterday afternoon to Minneapolis and drove over. I guess I stayed on West Coast time or something. I, I was sleeping just fine when the hotel phone rang. <laughs> so, really glad to be here. And, and it's a treat to be here, actually, and, and really glad to see so many people interested in this topic. It, it, it's, it's such a pertinent topic in our country right now uh, because of the opioid crisis, but uh, for me, uh, with a lifelong um, attention to this career-wise, it's just great to have so many more people involved and interested in addiction and coming to understand it for what it really is and providing the, the necessary services for people uh, that need them. Now this is a young woman uh, that I met, a uh, 20 year old female as a high school sophomore. She was doing really well. Uh, you know, good grades, playing soccer, wonderful daughter. That year she had a knee injury, commonplace in sports. Uh, went to her primary care doc who provided some oxycodone. And, you know, no concern. Uh, no real thought about this. Took the oxycodone and it just triggered uh, an addiction. It, as it turns out, she had a strong family history of alcoholism, but nobody put any of that together. And, and often enough, with a minor injury, people don't really consider such things. And unfortunately, it started her down a remarkably different path. Uh, Escalation of her drug use started right away. Where she started actually convincing her doc to continue to give her oxycodone, other physicians to give her oxycodone, and uh, ultimately her school performance diminishes dramatically. And, and this isn't an unusual story, unfortunately. In, in our um, in our uh, programs around the country, we see this every day. She didn't return to sports as a junior. She dropped out of high school as a senior. Heroin use began because it's cheaper, actually, and a lot easier for most people to access than going to doctors to try to get prescriptions on a regular basis. And she has four episodes of addiction treatment. She's overdosed multiple times accidentally. And then uh, after the final treatment that she went to, she goes back out. Um, and because of the loss of tolerance to the opioid when she was abstinent for the few weeks of treatment, uh, she used the same dose she was using prior to treatment, but it killed her. And uh, we see this every day all around the country. This is unfortunately what so much of addiction treatment has become. Uh, in our settings, we've had a remarkable and dramatic increase in folks with opioid use disorders, alcohol use disorders still being the number one reason c people come into our programs, but now the opioid use disorders are, are second um, and almost half of our population. And, and it all began, unfortunately, secondary to my colleagues, physicians, easing guidelines for the prescribing of these medications so that more people could have them. Uh, thinking they were doing the right thing. So it wasn't um, a malicious or, uh, you know, deliberate attempt to cause addiction, of course. It was a, a real 
lack of recognition that was going on and a change in thinking that we would uh, help more people from the suffering of pain. And that didn't work out well at all. Now, in the last 10 years, we've had over 150,000 overdose deaths in the country. Um, and that's more than any of our wars that we've ever been involved in. And yet, we don't get the attention necessary to address this problem. And part of the reason we don't is that people do not understand addiction. And you're looking at somebody that uh, is the opposite of the young woman at 20, but someone who started using alcohol at 12 and by 15 was using something every day and dropped out of high school at 17 uh, with addiction. I ended up at Hazelden at that point, luckily getting good treatment. And it was at 19 that I finally got sober. The fortunate aspect of that is it occurred in the late 60s, early 70s, when opioids were not available in a small town in southern Minnesota. <clears throat> and so I got a real early course in addiction. Um, and it changed my life dramatically in, in a lot of different ways. But uh, ultimately, it gave me this career uh, unusually. Uh, but I went to medical school thinking I'd become a cardiac surgeon and saw all these people with addiction in the hospitals when I was making clinical rounds and, and, and I would talk to my attendings you know, at Mayo Clinic where I went to school and they wouldn't identify addiction, we wouldn't refer people for treatment, we wouldn't do anything about it. When it was the underlying reason for the hospitalization, even though it wasn't what brought them in the door. And as a result of that, I was going to a 12-step meeting at the time in Rochester and complaining about this week after week. And two doctors that were attending the meeting grabbed me one night and took me aside and said, Marv, you have got to quit bitching about this and do something about it. <laughs> and it opened my eyes to possibility. Um, but also it started me down a path of trying to understand this illness and what was really behind it. And, and I'm hoping I can share some of that with you this morning because it is a really misunderstood illness. And yet in the last probably 20 years, we've gained a great deal of information on the medical side of things in regard to brain research that, that really supports an understanding of addiction as a brain disease, as a chronic brain disease, a lifelong brain disease. And I'm going to describe a couple of the areas of the brain involved and how that all works. Um, and I'll, I'll try and make this understandable. Uh, you know, neurobiology in the morning can be a little bit difficult, but uh, I'll, I'm hoping to make it uh, something that you can walk away from here uh, and really understand what addiction is actually all about. It, it isn't about moral or ethic, morals and ethics, that it's actually about remarkable changes in our brains that, that um, alter behavior and alter how we see the world. So th these are uh, some of the old ways of thinking about addiction. When I was in my training uh, in psychiatry and then in an addiction fellowship, uh, the primary way we looked at addiction is it was secondary or the caused by some other psychiatric illness. Not true at all. It, uh, uh, psychiatric illness increases the risk that we end up with addiction. Uh, it's one of the risk factors for addiction, but it doesn't cause addiction. It's not a moral or ethical problem, but I'd say still today around the country, that's how most of us look at it, that, that it's just, you know, why don't these people just, you know, hold their liquor? Why do they have to keep taking all those pills? You know, why shoot heroin? That sort of thing. Why don't they just stop? And that's why part of my title to this today is why don't they just stop doing that? And because it becomes almost incomprehensible why. You know, why would I, at a young age, start uh, stealing from my family, um, lying to everybody I knew so I could continue to use these drugs? Uh, why would the people around me do the same? And that's who I gravitated to in spite of the fact that, like that young woman in the example, that I was on the honor roll and all, all the sports teams I could be on in the band and the chorus. It's not a personality disorder, even though we publish a book called The Addictive Personality, 
Uh, and it's a common phrase and a common way of looking at this. It is not a personality disorder. It's true that during the course of addiction, people's personalities start to look a lot more alike than they do before the addiction actually starts. And after the addiction actually is stopped, they blossom back out to the usual sort of personalities that they had in the first place. But during the course of the addiction, we start acting the same, sounding similar, and, and, and looking really similar. So it's really easy to suggest that there's some sort of personality disorder behind all this, but it's not true. Nor is addiction a choice. I mean, there's a, certainly a choice that I have today whether I'm gonna pick up a glass of wine or whether I'm gonna go seek some amphetamine or cocaine or something, that, that's factual. And in everyone's life, they have a choice. It seems whether they're gonna you know, go out with their friends and, and uh, partake of illicit substances or legal substances. Uh, nonetheless, once addiction really takes hold, that choice is gone, and, and, and I'm, I'll describe that from this neurobiological basis during the course of the talk today. So addiction is not casual use, it's not recreational use, it's not social use of a substance, it's remarkably different. <clears throat> and you know, some of the differences lie in uh, these descriptions here. Most of these come directly from the diagnostic criteria used to describe addiction, so they'll be familiar to some of you who've, who've read or used those criteria, like compulsion to seek and take the drug. Now, for the individual in the midst of addiction, they usually don't see it as compulsion. For me, it was just, I just got high every day. I didn't see it as I had to get high every day. But the truth is, when it finally came to stopping, I realized just how much a compulsion was there. Loss of control, uh, in limiting intake it becomes unpredictable. People can't uh, determine whether they're going to be able to decrease their use on a daily basis or even into the future. Like, I, I, how many times do most people with addiction say they're going to quit, say they're going to stop, commit to it, tell their family, I, I'm, I've had it, I'm, I'm over with this, being unable to do so over time. For me, one time, one time only, I used socially during my use, uh, and, and you know, as an adolescent, uh, I mean, I started using at 12, I was done by 19, so um, you, <laughs> you have to uh, do a lot of sneaking around to be able to do that at that age, and, um, and none of it's social, I guess, if it isn't legal. I mean, I didn't drink legally ever, I didn't use drugs legally ever, so, uh, you know, the limiting of intake. I, I went to a Christmas party of the people that I worked with at the time, uh, a job that I really loved, which I'll tell you a little bit about as we go here. And, um, and the, the one, one of the guys was Swedish uh, from Stockholm, and, and he was working at uh, Mayo in Rochester. And he had some Swedish grog for the Christmas party, which I'd never heard of. So I, and I decided that I'd been through treatment already, and I knew that once I started drinking, it'd become unpredictable, so I probably shouldn't at all. But since he had that Swedish grog, I decided I'll try it at least. So I drank one, one cup of Swedish grog. That was it. That's my total experience of social use. Um, but I left that party later that night and then went out with friends and smoked pot, did speed, drank more. You know, so my social use experience is, is really limited by comparison to most people. But when we talk about social use, it's not like what I did, you know? It's not like trying to control it in order to have just one drink at the party and then going and getting wasted later that night. There's a diminished recognition of significant problems, which we'll talk about. I dropped out of first chorus, then band, than all the sports I was in, which meant more to me than school or anything else. And I somehow rationalized all of this. I had to because I'm trying to just lead my life moving forward. Didn't understand why. Then I drop out of school. Uh, I couldn't explain it. I thought I was going crazy, actually. I didn't know what that meant, but that's the term I had in my own head. There's something really wrong with me. I don't know what it is, but. I'm sure not going to talk to anybody about it, um, and I didn't. 
there's an emergence of a negative a emotional state or a negative affective state. And this is probably the newest aspect of the neurobiological theories behind addiction. This negative affective state is like a mild depression and anxiety that, that comes uh, forward in two ways. One, between episodes of use, so that when a person stops using at the end of the evening, you know, by the time they get started again the next day, this negative affective state, this depressive, anxious sort of angst starts to take over before they can use again. And also when they stop using for a long period of time. So let's say in early recovery, it continues with them. And, and I'll explain a bit more about that later, but it has to do with the brain's attempt to try to compensate for the intoxication on a daily basis. So if the individual is using, let's just say, opioids every day, the brain itself is trying to figure out how to keep them up and walking and talking and going about the usual functions of life. So all these brain cells are altering their protein function just to keep them, you know, standing up, able to interact with other people. And, and there's a dramatic shift in the stress systems of our brains because our stress systems like preparing for a speech you know you get a little anxious heart rate increases respiratory rate increases tension comes along all of that pr would prepare me to run a hundred yard dash as well you know or to ski down a really steep slope um, and I need that for those activities I needed a little to give a speech not a lot or undermine my performance but in our, during the course of addiction, it sticks around day in, day out, and becomes kind of fixed. It becomes the norm because it's compensating for the alcohol, for the opioids, for the cocaine, whatever, keeping me in check, so to speak. Uh, kind of a, in medicine, we call it a homeostatic response, that the, the brain is just trying to compensate for this absolutely abnormal situation of being bathed in the substances every day and keep things as normal as possible, but as a result, it overcompensates and these stress systems stick around even after people stop. And that stress system response is what causes a great deal of that angst and that, that, that sort of negative emotional state with discontinuation, which drives continued relapse, both immediately. Like for me, I wanted to pass out when I got home at night. Uh, that was my goal at the end of the day, every day. I did not want to lie in bed and have to think about myself and my life and how awful I was uh, behaving. I was absolutely ashamed of myself. I didn't want anyone to know, but everybody in my circles did. And I didn't want to see it because it was just too painful. So, and in bed at night or waking up first thing in the morning is when this sort of angst would attack, basically and I couldn't tolerate it. It's also what happens five months, five years, 20 years in recovery when let's say my wife dies today, I'm gonna feel awful. Yeah, emotionally, it's gonna be just horrible. And for those of us with addiction, it can bring us back subconsciously, not, I'm not gonna you know, consciously go down a path and think, boy, I feel just like I did when I was 17 you know, using all those drugs. No, that's not gonna cross my mind consciously, but subconsciously it's gonna feel exactly like that. And as a result, trigger the potential for relapse, uh, which we don't account for very well. And uh, fortunately, people in long-term recovery that really maintain relationships with other people in recovery who continue to involve themselves in 12-step programs and the like, can go and talk to somebody under that circumstance, talk to a bunch of people, get the support they need, rather than trying to just kind of gut it out on their own and then suddenly falling back into the addiction. Craving is not on the diagnostic criteria either. Craving also more recently understood as part of the uh, compulsion to seek and take the drug, but more out of a, a a sense that I just have to get there and, um, and use more. And sometimes it's that I just want to. The individual 
that, that there's multiple definitions of craving. It's hard to find a real good one. And when you talk, when I ask someone, you know, do you have craving? Well, they always ask me, well, what's, what's that? You know, I mean, I, I would like to use today. I, I, I'd kind of like to go get high today. Uh, I've been thinking about it. I don't want to, but I've been thinking about it. You know, which one of those is actually craving? And then chronicity and relapse, kind of the holy grail for the researchers in addiction. Why is it a lifelong illness? And my bias is it's because it alters the genes that govern our brain cells in such a manner that they're just waiting for the return to this state. And, and I'll describe why part of the brain, the reward center, actually really wants that to happen. So acute intoxication uh, is primarily in the reward circuitry of the brain. The reward circuitry of the brain is in the reward center, the bottom bullet here, the mesolimbic dopamine system. The reward center of our brains has to do with survival itself. The most rewarding things we do keep us alive and keep the species alive, keep all of us alive, keep, keep us, you know, populating the earth. And it's in that reward center that dopamine is released, the primary neurotransmitter in addiction, um, and drives us to return to the behaviors that keep us alive. So survival itself, survival of the species, sexual activity releases a lot of dopamine. We like sex in general, most people do, and it's reinforced. We like it enough, we're going to do it again. And the reward center is what takes care of that. Food as well, uh, a great meal. Uh, will release a lot of dopamine. Uh, if we've been starving, lost in the woods for a week, it doesn't matter what type of meal, it's going to release a lot of dopamine. We need it for our survival. We're going to keep doing it, same as um, liquids. And for humans, human interaction actually, human relationships release dopamine as well uh, in that same reward center. So this is key to understanding addiction because the reward center where survival itself at a subconscious level, I don't have to think through that I want to survive today. That I don't have to give that any conscious thought. Nor in the middle of addiction do I give conscious thought to the fact that my reward center has now been reprioritized in such a way that I am more interested in getting that drug again than I am in staying alive. So. If you can imagine, it's almost incomprehensible. That, that, as I think about this, as I've read the research studies on it, it, it always boggles my mind that, that somehow continuing to use the drug becomes more important than survival itself, and yet we have an understanding of why. This guy, you know, his, his brain was studied a bit too much. So dopamine and addiction. There's a lot of neurotransmitters involved in addiction, but dopamine's the primary one because of these facts. It, it, all rewarding activities, like I was just talking about, in that reward center of the brain, subcortical means it's subconscious. Uh, so it, it, it's, there's connections to the conscious areas of the brain, but the subcortical parts of the brain don't provide us with thought at all. We don't think through what's going on there. Uh, but the dopamine increases related to these rewarding activities. Uh, so I've, I mentioned skiing earlier. I love skiing. I'm sure when I'm skiing, I've got a lot of dopamine just releasing all the time. The amount of dopamine that's released, all it can do in that reward center is tell the, the cells there the importance or the salience of the stimulus that caused the release of the dopamine. More dopamine, more important. Less dopamine, less important. That, that's all it amounts to. And all drugs of abuse cause a superphysiologic release of dopamine. Way more dopamine than the normal natural reinforcers, like food and sex. So here's, here's some animal studies showing the release of dopamine associated with food and sex in, in rats. And here's uh, some of the drugs of abuse. You can see the remarkable increases here, especially from the amphetamines, and the opioids are the same, alcohol is the same. All drugs of abuse cause elevations of dopamine release in a very unnatural way, way more so than natural reinforcers, and it's this that causes that reprioritization of drive states 
And by drive states, I mean those natural things we do, like, like, and the animals do. Like a, a deer is going to forage for food when it's hungry. It doesn't have to think about it. it you know, its stomach starts growling or something that just goes and eats. And for us, it's much the same. We do that. But for those with addiction, it gets completely turned around so that their top priority, the number one thing going on in their brain at a subconscious level, remember, is to go get high again. So when I started stealing from my family, when I started shoplifting, when I started lying to all my friends and other people about what I was doing, my brain at the level of survival itself was telling me that this is so important, do anything to keep, do, keep getting those drugs, keep doing what you have to do, whatever it takes. So the establishment of the addictive cycle itself involves that reprioritization because once a person goes over that line, and you can understand if you're a social drinker, you know, that that's never happened to you, that you would think somehow that, that, that you would risk your life to continue use. You know, um, if you're 20 years old and, and you're at a job, you know, a summer job, you're in college, and, and you drink too much with people at work one Friday afternoon, you know, just going to happy hour or something, and you still think you can drive home because too much for you just was maybe an extra drink, it's just not a big deal. And you have a minor fender bender on the way home. And, and fortunately, you know, the police don't get involved, but nonetheless, uh, this is a big deal. So you decide for yourself, I'm never going to do that again. And you don't, right? Never. But me, that's not how I did it. I would tell myself, well, I'm never going to do that again. I can remember driving down Highway 52 in Rochester, Minnesota, blacking out, in and out of consciousness, seeing the white lines at one moment, not seeing anything the next, seeing the white lines and not seeing anything the next, somehow getting to my apartment and thinking, you know, I better not do that again. But I did it again the next night, and the next and the next. Thank God nothing ever happened like that. So establishment of the addictive cycle, positive reinforcement from the drug starts to diminish. So when, we, when we're using socially, when people with addiction first start, the primary way that they understand their use is out of positive reinforcement. I like it, I'm going to do it again. And, you know, I like skiing, I'll do it again. I like pizza, I'll do that again probably really soon. Um, and, and that's that starts to diminish during the course of addiction because the brain, that, all that stuff I described about the brain kind of compensating for the drug bathing those cells every day starts to reduce the effect of dopamine. So dopamine itself no longer being released to the same degree that it was before the regular use of the substance started to occur. Basically kind of like it's running out. And it actually gets to the point that natural reinforcers like sex, like food, like, you know, any great chocolate, whatever you want to put in there, those things no longer release the same amount of dopamine. It's like the whole system's dampened down by this response on the part of the brain, trying to reduce the intoxication, but it reduces the response to everything. So for a young guy in high school, the things I really enjoyed, like sports, are no longer as important. I don't like school at all. It really gets boring. You know, all these other things, my family, who cares? Partially because this dopamine response is no longer there in the same manner that it would have been because of the addiction itself. So the positive reinforcement actually is diminishing to all these things but also to the drug, while negative reinforcement, negative reinforcement is the relief, relief of a negative state or a painful state or a problematic state, which, you know, relief of pain is really a positive experience, you know, so that's what this is talking about. But that negative affective state that I described associated with addiction, with these stress hormones and everything, is what's, 
what's, what the relief of the drug causes because one of the few things left that can give enough dopamine to the brain to really allow it to function normally and then even above normal to the point of getting intoxicated is the drug now because the brain can't respond as well to the usual things that would allow for that. So the rewarding experiences of one's life are now diminished dramatically. The only thing you can do is use more and more drug to see if you can get back to that same level of high you had at the beginning. And that's what this, these first two points are about. A motivational withdrawal syndrome is established. That's easiest to see with opioid withdrawal, with people who are using heroin or oxycodone or something like that, because they are not going to die from withdrawal. It's not um, a fatal sort of medical condition going through withdrawal from opioids for the vast majority of people. They feel like they're going to die, and sometimes they just want to die because it's so awful. It's like the worst flu you've ever had. You know, vomiting, diarrhea, pain all over, shaking, just feeling absolutely awful. I think I'm going to die. Only I know if I just take that pill, I'll, it'll be relieved in minutes. So in the midst of that worst flu ever, there is a solution, and it's right there on the counter. And that motivates people to continue use. It's really motivating. Uh, and that's why, you know, straightforward description by the scientists, which is unusual. Um, and then incentive salience narrows the individual's focus. And this is back to what I was talking about earlier, that if the only thing left that really gets my attention in that reward center, the only thing left in my brain that, that really, you know, gives me that sense of well-being, that sense of my life is great, is getting high nowadays because nothing else can do it because of the diminishment of my response to all, all of the natural reinforcers, then I'm going to go and get high. But I also, when I talk to our patients uh, who come in with addiction, I'll ask them what their favorite hobbies and interests are, and then they'll give me a list of a few things, you know. Uh, and then I'll say, well, when's the last time you did that? And for most of them, they'll they'll have to really think about that because they no longer do those things anymore for the most part. I mean, maybe there's still one or two they still do, but mo and they hardly ever do. Most of them have really dropped by the wayside because the focus becomes the drug or alcohol use. So the addictive cycle is now described in three stages. They aren't sequential stages, they're just kind of going on together at about the same time. But it's a way of understanding it. It's it, from a neurobiological perspective. Each of these three stages involve different, really specific parts of the brain. And through the course of addiction, it's kind of like it starts with the reward center and, and the prefrontal cortex, which I'll tell you about, but it just keeps uh, involving more and more parts of the brain. It's just like taking over uh, life itself in a lot of ways. In, in some respects, I think of it as if, if using in a continued way is more important than survival, then our brain is working against ourselves in a, in a, in a certain respect and, and just kind of taking over our whole life so that we can continue this remarkably destructive pattern without even recognizing it. So there's a binge intoxication stage, all, all basically about the dopamine release that I was talking about, that you just keep using and using to get that release and trying to get more and more and more because it's not working as well over time. Tolerance and all kinds of other factors undermine intoxication itself, so you've got to use more. The withdrawal negative affective state, I've been describing that negative affective state, uh, and the motivational withdrawal all driving continued use. And when we think of addiction, it is all about continued use. So it's not about social use, it's not about once in a while. These are all about why. Why would people continue to use? And then preoccupation and anticipation, the craving, it starts to involve actually the thought centers of the brain because I have to think things through if I'm preoccupied with them, if I'm anticipating, I'm planning, I'm trying to figure out where am I gonna get some more cocaine? Where am I going to get some more heroin, some more oxycodone? Which doctors do I have to go see this week? Whatever it takes, trying to figure all that out. 
So a friend of mine's a neurosurgeon, and, and um, every now and then I get to go dress up in scrubs and wander around operating rooms and watch what he's doing. And, and so his work is remarkably different than mine. However, sometimes it's just like this, whoa, that was a good one. Try it. I was just poke his brain right where my finger is. And here's some brains. So the top, the top ones up here, these are people that were using, these are controls, these are normal brains, and, and this is a reward center. So the red is actually the highest activity going on in the reward center, really normal activity occurring in this reward center. And these are people who had been cocaine addicted that stopped, so that they're not using at the time of these brain scans. And this reveals that there's no red over here. This diminishment of the dopamine response that I've been talking about, the diminished activity of the reward center, is seen in these, fo in these pictures, these scans. So even to get from here to here, to get back to normal takes a lot of drug. To get above that, to get into an intoxicated state, takes even more. So after a while, during the course of this illness, brain function is diminished fairly dramatically just by the normal use of whatever substance it is. Happens with all substances, not just cocaine-related. These are just uh, common slides that are used to describe this. Then, so this is where this reprioritization of drive states take place. Then we've got the orbital frontal cortex, this, this large yellow area here is where we think things through, plan them out. And these are normal brains. These are the control brains. This is, you know, most of the people we know who don't have addiction. That they can recognize a problem. They can just, you know, look at ten different possible solutions. They're using their orbital frontal cortex to figure it out. They choose one and they carry it out. But look what happens over here. This is the cocaine abusing brain. Remarkably different here in the orbital frontal cortex. There's been a diminished function, diminished activity here. The yellow is the most activity. It's diminished pretty dramatically here and helps explain why, in the course of addiction, people don't see the problem for what it is. They don't recognize the consequences. They're being driven by this reprioritization here, saying, I gotta keep using that drug, and the part of the brain that should stay, no, that'd be really stupid, you know, you're really getting in a lot of trouble. You just dropped out of high school. You, you are a mess, you need help. Doesn't allow us to see it. So the brain itself, the part of the brain that should be helping fix the problem, address the problem, cannot do so. And so when people come into our settings and this is what their brains are like, they can't recognize the problem. So we see, well, why do people keep relapsing? Why do they stop and start? Why do they make all these promises and then can't carry them out? Well, it's these two things. They're being driven by something way more powerful than we can really understand, more important than life itself. And the part of the brain that should see that and help them figure it out is no longer functioning correctly. So another way of putting all this is addiction is a disorder of incentive salience, that this reprioritization of drive states. It's a reward deficit that there's no longer the same reward associated with natural reinforcers like I showed in those uh, MRI scans. There's a stress surfeit. That just means there's this enhanced stress response going on, the, the, causing that negative affective state, promoting continued use over time and relapse even after long periods. And then executive function is what the orbital frontal cortex is really all about. Uh, figuring all that stuff out is, is what we call executive function, and it's weakened, weakened recognition of what's really going on in our lives. So we're like the salmon out coming in from the Pacific Ocean, running up a river trying to spawn, and it's got to climb this waterfall. And, and, you know, it's really difficult getting up these waterfalls. I've, I've actually stood near some watching the salmon try and jump up, and, and if they're having a hard time, they don't stop at the bottom of the falls and think to themselves, you know, maybe I'll go back to the ocean for a couple of years and come back when I'm stronger. They're driven. Their brains are all, they are driven to go up there and spawn or die trying. And in some respect, that's exactly what's going on in the brains of those of us that have addiction. We're just going to keep going down that path because our brains are no longer functioning like the rest of the population. 
We have to keep doing this. We don't have a choice until remarkable interventions take place. So other, other risk factors really quickly here. What, what else causes addiction? Now, this, these are risk factors for drug use itself, environmental risk factors that, that would, you know, um, put a person at risk for using an illicit substance. And, uh, and there, there's a lot of studies about this stuff, but this is the most common thing described. So low socioeconomic class is part of it. You'd have to say that has to do with stress and other factors. Poor parental support, really important this day and age when we're, we're losing parental support in so many ways. And then drug availability. If I live in the wrong part of town and on every street corner there's a dealer or somebody that's asking my older brothers if, if they want to buy some drugs and get high, it's a lot more likely I will use drugs. Now what about key risk factors for addiction? So the first slide's use itself, the onset of use, this is about addiction, and it's primarily about genetic risk. So I'm Finnish, I'm 100% Finnish. You might know some Finns from around here. Uh, Finnish government was the first government in the world to announce that um, the number one cause of death was alcoholism. So there's a huge genetic load for addiction among Finns, as well as Native Americans and other populations around the world. Uh, so the genetic risk is 40 to 60 percent. If someone in your family has addiction, alcoholism, and the like, you, you and your children are at higher risk than the general population. Um, multiple genes are involved. We thought there was a single gene back during my training in the 80s. Now there's a recognition of over 300 genes involved in addiction, so it's not a simple problem to figure out, but I think someday we'll have a test, probably just swab the inside of your cheek and we'll be able to tell you that you have addiction or not. And there actually are genes that, that um, are preventative, that help people avoid addiction, they're protective. Stress is one of the more common features of, of, uh, of risk associated with addiction. And I mentioned earlier, psychiatric illness puts people at risk for addiction, and so does trauma, uh, sexual trauma, physical trauma that occurs, especially in, in childhood and adolescence, but at any point in life. Relapse risk has been studied separately. Uh, IV opioid use, uh, really much more likely to relapse from than other substances. A family history of addiction. In our setting, almost everybody has that family history, so it's not a great predictor, but it is a predictor. A co-occurring psychiatric illness, it's a risk for addiction, it's also a risk for relapse. And then level of craving, actually, if it sticks around, can cause relapse. And here's some factors actually that have been studied that re are associated with relapse prevention. Relapse prevention, basically abstinence, what keeps people sober long term. External supervision, in 12-step meetings they'd say a sponsor. Uh, in athletics they say a coach. Um, you, know, we, you know, even professional athletes don't necessarily do what they're supposed to in the off season to be prepared to be paid millions of dollars to get back on the field. Somebody has to be there telling them to do it because we don't naturally do that stuff. Ritualized dependency on a competing habit-forming behavior, 12-step programs could be just attending meetings, that sort of thing. For me, in early recovery, it was going trout fishing, <laughs> which seems funny, but uh, that was part of it. A new love relationship. And not a sexualized relationship, a new loving interaction with another human being. In addiction, we usually burn all our bridges with family in pretty nasty ways. We need new people involved to care for us, and that happens around 12-step meetings and other places. I'm not saying that's the only way. And then a deepened spirituality. Two of these four will increase the likelihood people stay sober. Three out of the four even more, so four out of the four even more. So when you hear about somebody, I got religion and stayed sober the rest of their life, well, somehow, usually that involves at least this and maybe this, or maybe even the ritualized dependency. So I hope that helps you understand this a little bit better. Uh, it gives you a different you know, kind of perspective on addiction. It's a chronic disease of the brain, lasts a lifetime. We still don't fully understand why. Like at 41 years sober, if I decided today was the day I'm gonna go celebrate this speech, that'd be a real problem for me. And um, 
know, Kirsten Justinger spoke earlier. She's in our HR department, and I'm sure they'd manage to get rid of me pretty quick from the job. <laughs> but <laughs> distinct neurobiological changes help us understand this stuff. And I hope, I hope I gave you a sense of that. And then treatment efforts that are long-term, it isn't a short-term solution here. Uh, we used to think so. Go to treatment for four weeks, you're done, you'll be fine, you're fixed. That's, that's not even close to what really is necessary. Uh, and we need to remember this uh, dysfunction in the brain in order to truly treat this illness correctly. So thank you very much. Glad I made it. Glad you're here. Thank you.